Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America. This episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. Thank you, Emma. It's great to have you all joining us here for Real Foot Forward, where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. Emma, before we begin, give me something remarkable you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America. Well, yesterday I sat down in the military gallery and watched the film that tells the story of Reconstruction and the early civil rights movement. So our special guest today is Jim Emerson, author and retired courtroom lawyer who has spent many years investigating the murder of Albert Williams more than 80 years ago. Uh, Jim, welcome. Thank you, Scott. I'm happy to be here. Happy I know to share this story with you. Excellent. Thank you. I know a real hero. I know that you are from around these parts. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about uh, where you came from and and how you ended up where you are. Well, I came from right where I am. <laughs> and that's about 50 miles south of Union City and the Discovery Park in the little town of Alamo, the county seat of Crockett County. And our county adjoins Haywood. And we're about 20 miles north of Brownsville. So I was born and raised here, went to public schools here, uh, left to go to college and then to law school and three years in the Navy JAG in Kodiak, Alaska, uh, and then back here in 1972 and began uh, law practice with my father until his death in 2008, and I went on for about another three years and retired at the end of 2011. And that's when I began this quest for justice for Albert Williams. Where was the first time, or do you remember the first time that you heard a little bit about the story of Albert Williams? Yeah, I remember it vividly. Uh, I had never heard Albert Williams' name until the end of 2011. I had probably tried, oh, scores of lawsuits in Brownsville. My father was an attorney. My uncle was. My granddad was. And all of them were practicing law when Albert Williams was murdered in 1940, but I never heard a single one of them mention it. Uh, And I had never heard of it. Nobody in Brownsville had mentioned it. I knew all the law enforcement officers. I knew all the courthouse officers, the judges. Uh, I had, I had many, many, many clients over there, black folks and white folks. None of them had ever mentioned it. I was doing a little research on a different topic and ran across an article from Wayne State University online that was titled Two Depression Air Lynchings in West Tennessee. One of them was a gentleman by the name of Albert Gooden in Tipton County near Covington. And the other was Albert Williams, Haywood County murdered June 20, 1940. It was about a page and a half about that murder. And I thought, wow, that happened three years before my birth. It happened while my grandfather was extremely active in New Deal Democrat politics in West Tennessee. He would have known about this for certain. Never heard a word. So, Scott, I had two friends that I thought would know about it. Both were in Memphis. One was a white lawyer and one was a black judge. I called uh, my lawyer friend first, Mike Cody. His, his firm 
and he was one of the lawyers uh, who represented Dr. King during the Memphis garbage strike. Thought, sure, he would know. He went on to serve as U.S. attorney in Memphis and then as attorney general of the state of Tennessee. And I thought, Mike Cody will have heard about this and can tell me all about it. Well, I told him what I'd read, and he said, Jim, I've never heard of that. And I thought, wow, okay. So I called my judge friend, Darmy Bailey, African-American civil rights activist, UC Berkeley Law School, served on the city council in Berkeley while he was going to law school out there. Uh, one of the uh, movers, originators of the National Civil Rights Museum. And when I told Judge Bailey the story, it wasn't what he said because he said almost verbatim what Mike Cody had said. It was how he said it. He said, Jim, I have never heard that story. So that literally set me on fire and motivated me to find out what the story was and tell it so that important voting rights history was not lost. That's what I've been doing ever since. So, so a lot of people listening um, their curiosity is peaked and they might not themselves have heard of Albert Williams. Can you tell us a little bit um, of, of what happened to him? Sure can. Uh, he worked as the boiler man at the Sunshine Laundry in Brownsville, Tennessee for about 10 years during the Depression from about 1930 till the time of his murder. He was a trusted employee who got there early and got the boiler fired up and got the steam up so the laundry machines would run. Uh, his white employer uh, depended on him to get his laundry going. He was married, didn't have any children. He married Annie Mitchell of Brownsville in 1929. They lived at 210 Bradford Street, a five-minute walk from the laundry. They both worked there. Made He made $10 a week, and she made eight. Haywood County, where they lived, Brownsville was a county seat, had begun its life as a slave labor cotton production plantation county. It didn't take but one white man to own a plantation, but it took scores or hundreds of black men to work it, black slaves. And by 1940, the most salient demographic in Haywood County was that the black population outnumbered the white population three or four to one. And the most salient political fact about that county was that the whites had disenfranchised the blacks by force at the end of the 19th century and did not allow them to vote. Haywood County at that time was more a police terrorist state than a democracy. It couldn't be called a democracy when black people were disenfranchised and force and violence was used to suppress them. So that was the culture into which Mr. Williams was born and in which he and Annie, his wife, lived. And by 1939, there was a group of courageous black men and women uh, that I'll call middle class, a doctor, uh, an undertaker, uh, school teachers, jewelers, pharmacists, 
who formed the first rural black majority county NAACP branch in the state. And it took a great deal of courage to do that. Their primary purpose was to regain the vote. So that, in a nutshell, is where Albert Williams met the civil rights movement, not in the 60s, 1939. He and Annie became charter members of that NAACP branch. And the white violence to suppress that branch began almost immediately. So you're so you're digging into the story and we're going to pick back up in just a minute. How are you uh, what what sources are you using to unearth the story? How are you where are you going to find information? All over. <laughs> I started in the courthouse in Brownsville because that's what I knew best. And I started by asking a few people over there I knew what had happened. And nobody really wanted to talk about it, but a couple of people did. I went to the records in the courthouse to dig up what I could about this event in 1940. Uh, I found the coroner's report, or I should say that the clerk of the circuit court and her staff found that report in a blank document pouch, unnumbered, unnamed, stuck down behind the court minute books in their archive. She was delighted to find it, and so was I. <laughs> I have gotten the unredacted Department of Justice case file and the FBI case file. I've been to the Library of Congress to research in the NAACP papers and have done research on those papers on the microfilm parts at the University of Memphis and the University of Southern Mississippi. I've had the University of South Alabama dig into the John LaFleur papers. He was the Southeastern organizer for the NAACP and uh, helped organize the branch in Brownsville. And I have interviewed a lot of folks. Now, did you have an interest in history earlier in your career while you were working as a lawyer? Was history something you also were interested in? I was a history major in oh. undergraduate school, and it was something I was interested in. And I was particularly interested in West Tennessee history. and. During my 43 years as a lawyer, uh, I really didn't have time to dig into any of those things, but I kept a little notebook that with clippings and news articles about events in West Tennessee history that interested me and that I thought when I retired, I might want to write about. And that's what I was doing when I ran across this article on Albert Williams and those clippings are still where they were in 2011, and I haven't worked on anything other than Elbert Williams and some associated and important civil rights projects in Tennessee. So take us back to, to um, where we left off, where Elbert Williams yeah. and his wife you know, were, were, had joined and were uh, involved. Okay. All right. That was in... Uh, spring of 1939. The people who organized that chapter were a married couple by the name of Ollie and Maddie Bonds. They had met when they were in college at Lane College in Jackson. She taught school. He had a funeral home in Brownsville. Uh, she was the first casualty of this. Uh, her job, I should say, was she taught at the Haywood County Training School, which was the black high school. And 
as soon as it was known that there was an NAACP chapter in Brownsville and that she was a member of it, she was fired. Uh, she found a job in an adjoining county. Uh, white supremacists who ruled Haywood County in those days were not shy about exercising their power, and they organized a boycott of the Ali Bond funeral home. They told the black people that lived on their plantations and that worked in their businesses, uh, if you take anybody in your family to Ali Bond's funeral home, you don't have a job, you don't have a house, you don't have anything. We won't sell to you, we won't extend your credit, and it'd be much better if you left town. That had a terrible effect on Ali Bond's funeral home business. Uh, but that wasn't enough to stop that NAACP chapter. So the Brownsville police began to harass Ali Bond, arrest him for different trivialities, and beat the living hell out of him. And his daughter, who was 13 at the time, who is still living and whom I have interviewed, told me about two policemen bringing her daddy home one time near the end of 1939, beat to a pulp, threw him on the couch and said, he's gonna need a doctor. She was 13 years old, scared her to death. Not long after that, that, that beating still didn't accomplish what the white folks wanted to accomplish, and that was to kill that chapter. Ali Bond's mother, the, who Ali was the president and organizer of that branch, his mother had a white father. His grandmother was a slave and bore his mother from the man who owned her. Let that sink in. Mm. That's rough. And his mother, who was a mixed race lady, had a white brother in Brownsville who was a dentist. Nobody knew about that blood kinship, but they were quite close. And Right before Christmas 1939, the white dentist went to his mixed race white sister and said, you've got to get Ollie out of town. There is a plot to murder him. They are going to burn his house tonight while he is asleep, so it will look like an accident. His mother got in touch with Ollie. He packed a suitcase. He took a train that afternoon to Kansas City. He never returned to Brownsville. That night, his home in Brownsville burned to the ground while his mother and his daughter watched. Horrible. Now, that didn't deter the others who were in the NAACP branch. They reformed, they elected Buster Walker, the new president. And finally, after they'd been doing this for about a year, five of them got enough courage to go to register to vote on May the 6th, 1940. A man by the name of Elisha Davis, who owned a service station. Buster Walker, who was the president and owned a fish market, and three other extraordinarily brave black men. Voter registration was really restrictive in Tennessee in those days, and, and you couldn't register to vote except for about a three-week period in August. And they said, well, we'll be back. The threats against those men began the next day. It started with delivery 
of a message by a courthouse hanger-on by the name of Straw Drumright, a very colorful character. Straw was sent to tell Buster Walker and Elisha Davis, the boys at the courthouse don't like what you're doing and said, if you keep it up, there's going to be trouble. They would not be dissuaded. The messengers, the status of the messengers increased to former chiefs of police, deputy sheriffs, mayor, current city councilman, and the nature of the threats increased over several weeks. They couldn't dissuade those people not to go back to vote. So in the middle of June, the white supremacists who ran that county uh, instituted Plan B. If we can't talk them out of it, we'll cut the head off of that snake. And a conspiracy was formed to kidnap Buster Walker and Elisha Davis and run them out of town. And on the night of Saturday, June 15, the mob of white men went after Buster Walker. He, he saw him coming in time. He hid. He got out of town. And he headed to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to tell the NAACP National Convention that was starting the next day what was going on in Brownsville. Elisha Davis, the service station operator, wasn't as lucky. At 1 a.m. on Sunday, June 16, Father's Day, a knock came at his door, and there stood two uniformed, unmasked Brownsville policemen whom he recognized, he knew him, Tip Hunter and Charles Reed. And they said, come with us. There were about six carloads of white men out there. His wife, Elisha's wife, Nan Davis, witnessed all of that, was terribly upset, thought about getting a revolver that her husband had given her. But she said, I knew that if I fired a shot at those men, they would kill my husband, they'd kill me, and they'd kill all our seven children. So she watched as they put her husband in a car and drove him away after telling her when she asked, what are you going to do with him? One of the men said to her, you will never see this black son of a bitch alive again. They took him to the Hatchie River bottom. They surrounded him. They threatened him with death. They made him tell who was in the NAACP so they could put their hit list together. Then they ran Elisha Davis out of Haywood County, Tennessee, and he never returned. His wife and children were still there. They moved in with his mother. His family was pretty damn well to do, pardon my language. He, uh, his, his dad owned a farm, and his mother lived on the farm. And Nan Davis thought she and her seven children would be safer with Elisha's mother on the farm than in Brownsville. And two weeks after that, the heat was still on and the murder had occurred. And we'll talk about that in a minute. A neighbor of Elisha's mother smuggled Nan Davis and her seven children out of Haywood County at night in the bed of a pickup truck covered by tow sacks so they would not be discovered and harmed. 
This wow. is 1940 America. And it's just as much a terrorist state as the ISIS state, the caliphate, and use some of the same methods. Well, and I can tell you that I've read a lot about the story just because I knew you. And of course, yeah. my family's from Brownsville. So but I knew having, that. You, having you tell it uh, to us uh, is uh, very much appreciated. And I can certainly uh, say that you bring it, you bring the tragedy to life so that we won't forget uh, what happened. Well, for a few days after Elisha Davis and Buster Walker were run out of town, I think the white terrorists thought they had accomplished their purpose. There was no new leadership of the NAACP. There was no talk about voting. Things were quiet. But they had not counted on Albert Williams. He was a very resolute man. Ali Bond said he was not easily intimidated and good grief if there was one characteristic you needed to be a black leader in a NAACP in Brownsville in 1940. Not being intimidated easily was it. So on Thursday afternoon, June 20, 1940, when Albert Williams got off work, he went to his friend, Elisha Davis's brother, Thomas, who was also a charter member, and he was the custodian of the Capitol Theater, and you may remember where that was, just off Court Square on South Washington Street. Yep, I do. Well, Albert had decided that he was going to lead that branch and that they were going to vote come hell or high water. And he basically told Thomas Davis in the theater, he thought in confidence, uh, we're going to have another meeting and we're going on and pursue our voter registration plan. We're not going to let this die. Unbeknownst to Albert Williams and Thomas Davis, they were overheard by the white manager of the theater. And he did what a white supremacist man in Brownsville in 1940 would do when he heard somebody planning an NAACP meeting and black voter registration. He called the police, and that night, without an arrest warrant, search warrant, probable cause to believe they had committed a crime or even that a crime had been committed, not even a suspicion of that, the Brownsville police kidnapped Thomas Davis from his home and Albert Williams from his home, locked them up, questioned them, not about a crime, about that NAACP meeting and voting. After about three hours, the, the sheriff, well, the Brownsville policeman let Thomas, let Thomas Davis go. And when he left the city lockup right there on Franklin Street, about a half block from the Methodist Church, and you'll know where that is too, mm -hmm. uh, he said there was a big crowd of white men out there uh, scared me to death, and I went home, got a jacket, and I ran to Jackson. And he said, they weren't interested in me. Thomas did. That was because they knew who the instigator was, Albert Williams, and he was still in the jail. And nobody who loved Albert Williams, cared about his welfare or employed him, ever saw him alive after that. Thomas Davis was the last black man we know about who saw a living Albert Williams. Three days later, his body was hauled out of the Hatchie River on Sunday, June the 23rd. The coroner held an inquest on the riverbank on Sunday morning, and the six white male inquest jurors found that 
Elbert Williams had died by foul means by at the hands of parties unknown. The coroner ordered an immediate burial. Elbert Williams' body was put in the bed of Al Rawls, Black Undertaker's pickup truck, taken to the funeral home. Mr. Rawls uh, had the grave dug, and as soon as it was ready that afternoon, he put Albert Williams in a pine box and took him out there and buried him in an unmarked grave, uh, the location of which has been lost. We don't know where it is. And there was no family there. There was no service. Mr. Wall said he did have a minister there who said a prayer and read a scripture. That was it. Uh, and that body and the evidence of murder it contained was six feet under Haywood County dirt when the sun went down on the day his body was found. No autopsy, no examination by a doctor, no cause of death determined. His wife identified his body on the riverbank, and so did his father. And she said, under oath, there were two holes in Albert's chest that looked like bullet holes. No effort to find out whose bullets those were. Uh, was made. None. Uh, and from there, it just got worse. The NAACP was able to persuade the Department of Justice to order an FBI investigation, but J. Edgar Hoover was a racist himself, and his racism tainted the entire Federal Bureau of Investigation. And they did no forensic work. They, they were in Brownsville June the 25th, two days after the body was buried. They did not seek to exhume Elbert's corpse to have an autopsy done at the UT Medical School in Memphis, 50 miles away. They didn't attempt to determine where the murder scene was. They gathered no evidence. They took no photographs. Uh, they didn't do anything but, quote, interview people on their own turf. And it basically would go like this. What do you know about Elbert Williams' murder? Well, don't know anything. Thank you very much. And that was about the extent of the FBI investigation. Uh, it was not welcome. Uh, the FBI did not welcome the order to investigate it and did as little as they possibly could. So did the U.S. attorney in Memphis. The Department of Justice, however, had an interest for a while. And in 1941, the chief of the criminal division, who was the number two prosecutor in the nation, he reported directly to the attorney general. Uh, twice ordered the U.S. attorney in Memphis to indict the list of people they had uh, that Elisha Davis had recognized as customers at his service station. He knew them. And they included Brownsville policeman, by then Haywood County Sheriff Tip Hunter, and Brownsville policeman Charles Reed. The U.S. attorney in Memphis would not do it and asked for a conference with the chief of the criminal division that fall in Washington, and that's where the Department of Justice record has a six-week gap. We don't know whether that took place, who was there, what the result was. None of that is in the file. There's correspondence up till that, and there's correspondence and stuff after that. But for six weeks, there's a gap. The gap ended with a memo written by the chief of the criminal division who had twice ordered the indictments saying to the attorney general, we need to close this case because the evidence is insufficient. There's no explanation of that. 
he had earlier told the U.S. attorney in writing in those letters that the department has carefully reviewed this case, and his word was undoubtedly was a violation of the federal civil rights law. Why the about face is still a mystery and may never be solved. But on January 23, 1942, the Attorney General of the United States, Francis Biddle, closed that file. And two days later, on January the 25th, the white people of Sykeston, Missouri, chained a black man by the name of Cleo Wright to the bumper of a pickup truck, dragged him through the streets of Sykeston, took him into the black section of town, doused him in gasoline, set him on fire, and burned him to a crisp. And two days later, the Japanese propagandists, we had been in the war for about six weeks then, were broadcasting all over Southeast Asia to the colored people of those countries, the cinnamon colored people, the Asians, the Malaysians, the Indonesians. If the allies win this war, this is what you can expect. So it's a sordid story. As you're as you're uh, researching and uncovering this information, and and clearly, you know, finding information that has been long buried, what is the mechanism by which you're planning to use it to communicate the story? Are you gathering information for a book, a documentary, a newspaper article, a blog? All of the above. <laughs> uh, the unedited. Manuscript, 344 pages, is complete. It's in the process right now of being edited and hopefully cut down to something between 250 and 300 pages, focused. And once that's done, I will begin to shop for a literary agent and a publisher. Uh, I have spoken to every group that's invited me, except one. I had to cancel in Nashville after the lockdown last spring. Well, that's what I was going to say. You um, and we're going to talk about the um, the monument, the historical marker, in a minute. But oh yeah, you clearly got the word out. So um, somehow, even way before the book is done. People are aware now of the story, thanks to you. You've you've brought national awareness to it. Um, how did how did that happen? Well, uh, in 2015, the 75th anniversary of the murder was coming up on June 20. So I should t- back up about a year before that. A very good friend of mine in Brownsville. African-American, retired Army man, John Ashworth, and I formed the Elbert Williams Memorial Committee. And we were intent on doing two things. We wanted to hold a memorial service for him since there had been no visitation or funeral or service of any kind. And we wanted a historical marker that spoke the truth. So John went to work on organizing the uh, memorial service, and I went to work on putting the application for the marker together. That application process is rigorous. Every fact, you, you have to list the text you want on that marker. You have to give them the GPS coordinates where you want that marker. You have to document every fact on that marker with primary documents. It took, putting that together took about a month. It was referred to the Markers and Monuments Committee of the Tennessee Historical Society. And they liked everything about that marker 
except the words white terrorists. And we insisted that the marker say that Albert Williams' murder was the culmination of a white terrorist campaign. They wanted to take white and terrorist out. And we said, no, no, no. We, we, we'd rather not have a marker than have it gutted. So John and I drove up to Nashville when the Tennessee Historical Commission was going to consider it. And I made our argument. I'd been doing that in court for a few decades and uh, persuaded them to put that language back in it. And I think it was the first and may still be the only marker in Tennessee that documents a crime that resulted from white terrorism. And I'm very proud of that truth that is spoken there. Meanwhile, John's working on this wonderful memorial service. It got so big that we had to get the Haywood County High School Gymnasium as the venue for it. Uh, long story short, 600 people attended that service. 600 black people, white people. Almost everybody in that Albert Williams family attended. Uh, the keynote speaker was Cornell Brooks, who at that time was the president of the NAACP. Congressman Joy, Joy, excuse me, Congressman John Lewis recorded about a three-minute videotape specifically for that memorial service that we played. God rest his soul, a hero. Mm. And I believe there's a video of all that on uh, YouTube. And so we'll there is. We'll there's a, a link. YouTube video of all of that. Yeah, we'll put a link to that on the show notes for the episode. All right. Now, uh, my attempt to get the United States Department of Justice to reopen this case uh, has fallen on deaf ears, both at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Memphis and at the Civil Rights Division in Washington. Uh, I was hoping they would order a new FBI investigation. And I was hoping that they would be so dismayed that their Department of Justice had done this mysterious about face on this case and closed the case that they said was undoubtedly a violation of federal civil rights law, that they would be shamed into reopening it and turning whatever evidence they found over to our local district attorney. There's no statute of limitations on murder in Tennessee. So what do you say? What do you say to people who say to you, why don't you let it go? Why is it important? It happened so long ago. Everybody's dead. Uh, why does it matter? It matters just as much as the Nuremberg trials mattered. It matters just as much as hunting down Nazi terrorists who murdered people in concentration and death camps in Europe who are in their 90s it, because they're the same type of people. These were white supremacist police terrorists. They were terrorists just as much as the ISIS people were terrorists. What does what does justice for Albert Williams look like in 2021? Very different than it would have looked like in 1940. Uh, I was able to persuade our local district attorney to reopen this case, and he reopened the murder case on the 8th of August, 2018, and there's been some investigation. We're still wanting to find the grave. We want to memorialize that grave. That's part of what justice looks like. Finding his remains that are in an unmarked grave and marking that grave so that his descendants from now on know there's Albert, there's our hero. He's right there. 
and so that he can be given a place in the pantheon of civil rights heroes like Medgar Evers. So that's part of what justice looks like, finding that grave and marking it with, with respect befitting a national hero, because he is one. It, it means doing everything you can to determine whether there's anyone living who participated in that crime. If there were, they need to face the bar of justice. And uh, they would be in their 90s now, but there is a whole community of people who got no justice in 1940, none who nobody cared enough about for 75 years to even say, I know it's late, but we're going to look into this. An injustice was done, and we want to do what we can do to make it right. So people appreciate that. And I think the demonstration that the state, the power of the state of Tennessee now recognizes this was a murder. And it is something that if there is a living participant, they should be brought to the bar of justice now, even though they have escaped it for 75 years. That's part of it. Having him known is part of it. John Ashworth and our group in Brownsville in 2016, on the 76th anniversary of the murder, combined with EJI, Brian Stevenson's uh, institution in Montgomery, Alabama, the Equal Justice Initiative, and we gathered uh, soil. And I actually scooped it up out of the riverbank on the Hatchie River and so did one of Albert Williams' descendants. And we had a ceremony in which EJI brought an urn, now displayed in its museum in Montgomery, Alabama. It had Albert Williams' name on it, had the date of his death, Haywood County, Tennessee. And we brought the dirt from the site where his body was found in a bucket with a trowel to that ceremony. And the people who attended at the end, we passed by in much the same way you might take communion. And we got a trowel full of that dirt and put it in the urn. Whew. Moving. I have been to Montgomery and seen that urn. That's part of justice. He's memorialized there. We got, with the help of Gloria Sweetlove, another Brownsville lady who's the chair of the Tennessee Conference of the NAACP, we got the NAACP, the national organization, to pass a resolution honoring Elbert Williams' commitment. So his family has that to fall back on. And I'm still not done with the U.S. Department of Justice. I, I'm going to take a second shot at that. Uh, I, maybe the people who are there now uh, do have enough shame that they might want to uh, reopen this investigation and do what ought to have been done back in 1940. And if we could find that grave and find the bullets, if there were bullets that killed him, they'd still be there. And if we find those, uh, I know where the gun is that was carried by Tip Hunter, uh, the policeman who arrested him. And I want to see if those bullets, Gun, if that gun matches those bullets, it it would either exonerate him or damn him. So it, it sounds like your book is not over yet. There may be a second book. 
<laughs> so if somebody, I know that you've, a lot of people have discovered things they didn't know about on today's podcast. If they wanted to follow along and keep up with what you're doing on this, uh, do you have a website or someplace they should go? Yes. The website is Albert Williams first to die. All lowercase, just one big old long run together work phrase. Albert Williams first to die dot com. It's sorely out of date, but it has a huge amount of material in it, nonetheless, uh, such as Roy Wilkins' typewritten and recorded eulogy at the Medgar Evers funeral in 1963, where Roy Wilkins, who was there in 1940, says, we stand on the shoulders of men like Albert Williams. It's amazing. Um, I know a lot of people are uh, have really been enlightened and are going to leave here uh, and go research and look up more information. Um, I really, really appreciate you being here with us today, and we'll put links to the website uh, in the show notes as well. So, um, all right. Thank you so much. And I wish you luck with uh, getting the book uh, published and, and in the hands of people around the world. I'm going to work hard on that. And I might add that there is in the works now a non scripted documentary film that I hope both the film and the book will be out by the end of the year. And Scott, uh, if you want, more links. I'll send you a couple more links. I've written short biographical passages for blackpast.org, an encyclopedia of African Americans, for the National Civil Rights Museum, and for Henry Louis Gates' African American National Biography, which is online by subscription. Uh, and, and the Department of Justice has posted its reasons for not reopening the case. So there's a link to that. If you'd like to have it, I'll gladly send it to you. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, it, I'm very passionate about it and have devoted a decade to it. Uh, the injustice was just so great. And to think that a man was murdered because he wanted to vote. Uh, which was his legal right uh, by people who wanted, who would rather commit murder than allow their political power to slip away. Uh, the injustice of that to me just screamed, this is a story that needs to be told. And it turns out that it's pretty doggone timely right now. Yeah, I was just going to say, we really haven't come as far as some people would like to believe that we have. <laughs> and steps can always be retraced. Movement forward can always be lost. And you fight this fight every generation. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.